Genesis chapter 3. So everything has started off pretty great. Uh, we've got the garden. God's created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and then he formed this garden called Eden. And he places Adam and Eve there. And Adam and Eve perfectly follow after God for a time. And things are going really well. Uh, Adam and Eve are co-reigning with God. They're united in marriage. They're showing the world what it means to have a relationship with the one true God. And then everything goes downhill fast, which is really a theme all throughout the Bible, where God perfectly in his faithfulness sets everything up for mankind's success, and then we choose sin continually. And fortunately, God still provides a way out. And this is kind of the first story where we see that happening. And so Genesis chapter 3, starting, of course, with verse 1. And now here we're introduced to the serpent. All right. And so the serpent, it says in chapter 3, verse 1, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So it's important to note that the Lord God makes the serpent. And we'll talk about that here in a second, or we'll address some of the questions that come up with that. But one of the questions that we have to ask is, who was the serpent? Now, traditionally, as Christians, we understand the serpent to be Satan, but right here in the story, it doesn't tell us that. In fact, we don't actually, if we're just going by the Bible, we don't actually find out that this serpent really is Satan until we get to the book of Revelation, until we get to the very end of the Bible. And now the Israelites may probably understood this to be true, especially once they started to kind of be revealed to this this idea of who Satan was, which was probably closer to the time where they were in exile in Babylon. But Revelation 20 verse 2 reveals in this vision that this dragon that is making war against the church is Satan, and they call him this ancient serpent, clearly referring back to the serpent in the garden. So it is safe to say that the serpent here in the garden is Satan, but for our story, Adam and Eve have no concept of who Satan is. There's just this crafty serpent in the garden. Uh, and like I said, the Israelites' understanding of who Satan was didn't really start to grow until their time in the Babylonian exile. For example, when we read the story of 2 Samuel chapter 24, and in verse 1, this is a story that was compiled or written before the Israelites went into exile. And it says that the Lord incites David to take a census. All right, But in 1 Chronicles 21, this being a story that was written after the exile, after they had kind of developed this idea of Satan or who Satan was, they tell the same story in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, but it says that Satan is the one that incites David to do this census. And now we'll, as we go through our study of the Bible, we'll kind of flesh out this relationship between God and Satan and hopefully kind of pull out a little bit more of who Satan is and what his role is in all of this. Um, but what does this tell us about how the Israelites viewed Satan and God? It's interesting because in this same story in First Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 24, it's, it's kind of interchangeable here. Either God did it or Satan did it. And I think what we, we learn about Satan is that Satan is powerless to do anything except at the command of God. God is the one who's sovereign. It's not like Satan is running around amok doing things that God kind of has to clean up after, but Satan has to go to the Lord for permission to do anything, and this is revealed better than anywhere else in the story of Job. I mean, Satan is not allowed to do anything without the permission of God. In other words, especially with the ancient Israelites, Satan can be seen as an agent who at times performs the will of God. And now this is in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we get a very different picture of Satan's role, and we'll get to that eventually when we get to the New Testament. But at this point, we got to understand that Satan does nothing apart from the will of God. Satan cannot usurp God's will. And so anything that Satan does, he's allowed to do only to the extent that it fits into God's sovereign plan for the world. Another thing to note is, in the ancient world, like I said, especially with the Israelites, anything and everything that happened in the world was at the hand of God. There was no such thing as chance. There was no such thing as an event that was out of God's hands. And so, what does this serpent represent to the original audience or the original hearers of this story? 
Now, in the ancient Near East, serpents were creatures of chaos. Uh, in the ancient Near Eastern mindset that these Israelites were in, they there was this they believed in this chaotic realm below the earth and in the old testament they refer to this place as sheol all right and there dwelled all kinds of chaotic evil creatures that were outside of the normal order of things and included in that group of creatures were serpents all right we got to remember that these israelites also are just coming out of egypt where serpents are also part of the religion there now, some Egyptians believe that every night the sun god Ra would die, hence the sun would disappear, and he would go into the underworld, which was their equivalent of the Hebrew idea of Sheol, and Ra would battle this giant serpent, and he would kill the serpent, and he would raise to life again, and the next day, the sun would come up again. That was kind of one of the religious teachings that they had. Um, also, as an interesting side note, this word serpent could possibly be translated in a couple of different ways. We've kind of traditionally gone with serpent um, because it kind of makes the most sense. But it could also be translated as dragon, like in Revelation. Or some scholars, uh, I mentioned John Salehammer when we did our study of Genesis 1 and 2, and he actually suggests this, that it could be translated into crocodile, which would make a very different <laughs> picture in our storybooks that we tell children when we tell this story. Uh, but anyways, we're going to go along with serpent just for the, the time being. But we'll take a look at that again. We'll revisit that again when we get to the part where the serpent is cursed here in Genesis chapter 3. And so that kind of helps us answer a bit who the serpent is, whether it's a snake or a dragon or a crocodile. Really, this is Satan tempting Adam and Eve. And so another question we have to ask then is, how was this serpent in the perfect garden? I mean, I don't know if that's ever bothered anybody else, but traditionally the story in chapter 3 is told that there was never any sin anywhere in the world, and yet we have this sinful, crafty creature. And now this question is kind of, I think, answered in our first question, and when we asked who this serpent was. I mean, the simple answer to how did this creature get there is, God placed it there. God made Satan. God made this serpent. All right. This serpent, a.k.a. Satan, is part of God's creation. And God allows the serpent to be there. In God's sovereign power, he places that serpent there. And now that might bring up some tough questions like, well, why would God do that? Why, If God wanted people to obey, then why would God place the serpent there in the first place? But think about it this way. I'm married to my wife, Jan, and we've been married for over 10 years now, and she's an incredible human being. She's better looking than I am. She's smarter than I am. She's wiser than I am. I mean, she's just all around. She's funnier than I am. She's all around a better person than I am. And now one of the reasons that I know she loves me is because I can look out across the world and I can see a lot of guys that have more money than me, that are better looking than me, that are just way all around better people than me, better guys than me. And I can look at them and be like, man, she really should be married to those guys because they're better than I am. And she could be if she had chosen that. But I know that she loves me because she chose me. That's how I can trust that she chose me because she had other options kind of a thing. She had the option to not love me. And I think that's kind of the same thing that's going on here with Adam and Eve. Because if... I, for example, if I was the only person left on earth, if I was the only man left on earth and Jana had no choice but to marry me and we had to repopulate the earth or something like that, I wouldn't really know that it was love because she didn't really make the choice to love me. There really was no other choice. And I think that's what God does sometimes with our faith. I think sometimes God tests our faith to say like, you know what, you have the option to sin or you have the option to show that you love me by obeying me. And this is kind of how I think God tests our faith to see if it's genuine. And I think he's testing the faith here of Adam and Eve. All right. So everything until this point in our story has been providentially controlled by God's hand. So it's hard to believe that this is just something that just so happened and God just stepped back to see how it would play out. It seems as if God places the serpent there as a test of Adam and Eve's faith. All right. And if you have more questions about Satan, which a lot of people do, his origins, his purpose, 
Um, just keep checking out the blog section of a word about God.com in the near future. Um, or maybe it's up now, depending on when you're actually listening to this teaching. Um, I'm one of the things that I really love talking about. One of the answers or the whole thing with Satan is something that I've gone searching after answers for. And, uh, some of the answers to these questions might kind of surprise you because they surprise me at least when I saw what the Bible actually says about who Satan is. So, um, look for that teaching or look for that blog post. Hopefully that'll be up there soon or it's there already. Um, if you're listening to this later. And so anyways, God places the serpent there and it seems as if he's doing it to test the faith of Adam and Eve. And so in chapter three, verses one through four, we've got the serpent actually tempting Eve. And he makes a very interesting comment here where he says, did God actually say, right? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And so Satan here is testing the faith of Eve by challenging God or really by accusing God. Because Satan, every time we see the word Satan in the Bible, which isn't often, but every time we see the word Satan, it actually is the Satan. And Satan means the accuser. All right. And so any time that we see Satan in the Bible, what he's doing is he's accusing. He's either accusing God or he's accusing the people of God. And we'll see that throughout our study here. But he says, did, you, did God actually say you may not eat of any of the fruit of the trees? Now, we know that that's not what God actually said. But what Satan does is he twists God's words to see, just makes a subtle little change there to see if she, Eve, really knows what God has actually said. And this is a major issue in the church today because many people quote things that sound like what God would say or sounds like what he has said in his word, but they throw in these little slight variations. And when we believe it and we don't study God's word for ourselves, it causes confusion and it causes a lot of hurt in the church. And thankfully, at least at the first part here, Eve responds correctly and she recites what God actually says to them or said to them, she said, he said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. All right. And so in 217, when God says this, what's interesting is the language here indicates that this is an immediate death. Um, I was listening to a teaching by R.C. Sproul, the late great R.C. Sproul a while back, and he was looking at the word here. And what he says in chapter 2, verse 17, um, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This does not mean, at least in the language, that eventually you will die. It seems to indicate an, etern or an immediate death. Not like you'll run out of eternal life or something like that, but the language is that you will immediately die. There will be this immediate curse because that's what you immediately deserve. And so Satan refutes this, trying to make Eve think that death is not such an immediate threat. And so, and then we go on in 3 verse 5, Satan continues to accuse God. And this time he accuses God of withholding things from Adam and Eve. You know, God is, God is just afraid that your eyes will be open. And he's afraid that you'll be like God, and that you'll know good and evil and things like that. And he challenges what Eve knows of God's character. Is this really what God is like? Is he really a God that withholds good things, things that he knows that you need? And so in 3 verse 6, we see this first sin with Eve. And before Eve even takes a bite of the fruit, I think she sins. She looks at the fruit, she sees that it's good, and she desires it in her heart. And then she takes it and she eats it, and that envy sprouts into full-grown rebellion. All right, and we see that in verse 6. She saw that it was a delight to her eyes, and that's what caused her to eat it. Unless we think that we can single-handedly blame Eve, look who's standing idly by. All right, we don't have Adam stumbling along, all of a sudden seeing Eve and being shocked and appalled at what he sees. Adam seems to be right there the whole time. Adam's just kind of standing there. He says nothing. He just allows his wife to listen to the serpent and eat the fruit. And then he puts up not a single iota of a fight when she hands some to him. And then in three verse seven, or three verse seven suddenly they're ashamed to be around each other because they realize that they're naked. All right. And so not only does sin cause a separation between us and God, but it causes this rift between humans, including husband and wife. With sin comes the distortion of sex. 
the thing that is meant to bring husband and wife together and unite them as one flesh, it's now something that can be so easily corrupted and turn from something so beautiful to something just disgusting and shameful. And so they're ashamed of one another in their nakedness. And then here comes God, 3 verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. And so this prior relationship that Adam and Eve had with God was so close that they could even recognize the sound of his footsteps. I mean, I can do that with my kids. Our kid's room is just right down the hall from ours. And if one of my kids wakes up in the middle of the night to like go to the bathroom, I can tell which one it is by their footsteps, whether they're running fast or walking slow or whatever. And this is, this is how, even though I can't see them, I know which child it is, you know. And this is how well Adam and Eve knew God at this point. They knew him just by the sound of his footsteps. There's animals and all kinds of things walking around in the Garden of Eden at this point. But they know God simply by his footsteps. And of course, in 3 verse 9, God calls out to them and says, where are you? And of course, God knows exactly where they are. But we see God do this in the Old Testament. He asks people what they're doing. He gives people an opportunity to admit their sin. God is calling Adam out on his sin. God doesn't shy away from it. God is love, but God in his love will not let our sin go unpunished. And he's going to address it. And then in 3 verses 10 through 13, Adam and Eve admit their nakedness. I mean, Adam and Eve had been naked before God before. I mean, completely open and unashamed before him. But now they knew there was shame. They knew there was separation. Adam, instead of taking the opportunity now to take responsibility for his wife when God confronts them, this wife who he's supposed to be taking care of, he's supposed to be watching out for her, Adam turns the blame on her. All right, we look, see this in chapter 3, verse 12. The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And then Eve, in turn, passes the buck and blames the serpent or Satan. And each of them, in reality at this point, really who they're blaming, they're blaming God. I mean, Adam blames God for even giving him a wife in the first place, which is preposterous because Adam was nothing without Eve. And without Eve, he wasn't useful. We saw that in chapter 2. And Adam has the audacity to tell God that it's his fault that he sinned because God gave Adam, Eve, to be his wife. And then Eve kind of does the same thing. She blames God for placing the serpent in the creation. She knows that the serpent is part of God's creation, and so she blames God for her sin. And we see a lot of this blame shifting in the wilderness later on with the Israelites too who are hearing this story for the first time, the same ones. Um, and so they can relate to Adam and Eve. Because the Israelites blame Moses, but God consoles Moses by encouraging him that they're not rejecting Moses. They're rejecting God as their God. And we see that in Numbers 14, verse 11. And then later on in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, when they reject Samuel as their spiritual leader and they ask for a king like all the other nations. This is really part of the nature of sin, rejecting God and blaming him for all of the bad choices that we've made and going after someone or something else instead. And so in chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, we get the curses that God gives to the people. So take note in this section of who or what is actually being cursed and what these curses really mean. So the first one to be cursed is the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent in verse 14, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So the serpent now is cursed more than any other livestock. And he has to crawl on his belly, which could indicate that maybe it actually was a dragon or a crocodile that had legs. I've heard it taught that way before, that God just takes the legs away and now the serpent has to crawl on the dust. Uh, but it says that he needs to, now he shall eat dust. And now, of course, snakes obviously don't eat dust. We know that. However, it's interesting that dust is what mankind is said to be made of in the creation narrative. And so this could be a symbolic way of describing the job of Satan and what it is, which is to tempt and to try to devour mankind, like what's said about him in 1 Peter 5, 8. And this is further illustrated in the next verse, 
where he says there will be strife between him and mankind or the offspring of the woman. And here we get our very first messianic prophecy. The woman's offspring, who eventually is Jesus, fully God and fully man, the son of Eve, according to Luke chapter 3, verse 38. The offspring, or the Messiah, will bruise the snake's head, indicating a killing blow, even though the snake will bruise his heel. A snake bite on the foot usually was a death sentence back then. But the Messiah will revive, all right? Jesus' death looked like the end, but his resurrection showed otherwise. And so it's amazing that in this dark moment of mankind's sin and rebellion against God, God still chooses to give them this prophecy that he's going to redeem them someday, that it's not over for them. And even in cursing and punishing, God is promising redemption. And then God turns to the woman in verse 16 and says, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And so what we see here is that the woman is not actually cursed, although she does suffer consequences. And now I want to take a look at this phrase, pain and childbearing. Now this word pain has been suggested by scholars that can be better translated to anxiety. And childbearing can be better translated to conception. It's not childbirth, it's conception or childbearing, carrying a child. So what does this mean? Looking at the translation this way, it's tough to claim that God is cursing Eve with painful childbirth or like childbirth was just painless before then, but now it has to be painful. Some people have suggested that, but I don't think the text necessarily suggests that. In the ancient world, a woman's only hope was bearing children. If a woman couldn't do that, she basically had to resort to either prostitution or death because nobody wanted to marry her. And so now bearing children was no longer a carefree thing, but really it's a matter of life and death. And there's a lot of anxiety in that. It says your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Some translations like the ESV have said that her desire shall be contrary to her husband. Now, prior to the fall, sex was something that a man and a woman, a husband and a wife shared in a mutually loving, open, unashamed way. Now that sin has corrupted sex, men often want sex just for the sake of sex. And the ancient Near Eastern women simply wanted children oftentimes as a means of survival. And so now because of sin, sex is something that has the capacity to hurt and even kill marriages. When God created it, it was a means of unifying people. But because of sin, it's now something that drives people apart and causes them to resent each other and to hurt each other. And when it says that the husband shall rule over her, it means that now she has to rely on her husband as a means of survival and pregnancy. Sex is now becoming something stressful instead of something that's purely enjoyable. And then we get to the man. And this is what God says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now in verse 17 it says, In pain you shall eat of it, or that could again be translated, In anxiety you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And this is the most extensive sentencing, really showing that Adam was held at a higher responsibility, thus we can't blame Eve for his sin, and neither can Adam. But it, Adam himself, mankind, is not actually cursed either in this section. The land is cursed. The land will not readily or easily produce fruit anymore. Opposite, likely, of how things originally were in the Garden of Eden. Hence why Adam's going to have to till the land in anxiety. Like, I'm not sure if this is going to work out. Thorns and thistles now will compete against these fruit-bearing trees for space. The work will be hard. And now death here is not actually necessarily a consequence when he says to dust you shall return. I think what this is God doing is just simply reminding Adam of his place. Adam has no right to blame God for his mistakes because Adam is simply dust. He's simply a human and God is God. Lest Adam ever thinks of blaming God again, let him always remember that he is mortal while God alone is immortal. If mankind is ever to experience eternal life, something has to be done. And what I think this verse actually shows is that mankind is likely not inherently mortal. And we look at chapter 3, 
verse 22, it says this, um, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. All right. So this maybe indicates that mankind is not inherently eternal beings. Um, God indicates that he does not want mankind to have eternal life in their sinful state. So something has to be done about sin before they're granted eternal life. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but God is the one who grants eternal life as a gift. 1 Timothy 6 verses 6 or 13 through 16 shows that Jesus alone is the one who inherently has eternal life. However, God institutes a plan for us to have eternal life here and have it free from sin. And so was this harsh of God? Adam and Eve, think about this. Adam and Eve have just rebelled. And they rebelled against and disobeyed this holy, perfect, righteous, just God of the universe. And they know that because of that, they deserve to die that very day, like we looked at earlier. And yet God and his love and his mercy does not immediately destroy them. God does not give them what they deserve. And that's mercy. In verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. God covers over their sin. God makes a way. God's mercy triumphs over his justice. And we see this over and over again in the Old Testament. And this is so important to understand because many people accuse the Old Testament God of being a different God than Jesus. One who operates in hatred and retribution and judgment. But when we get to the books of the law, like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we see that God lays out similar commands. Um, do this and be blessed, or rebel and be cursed. And all of these with an immediate connotation. Like, if you disobey me immediately, you will be disciplined. However, Israel disobeys for thousands of years. And for thousands of years, God holds, or I should say hundreds of years, I guess. Hundreds of years, though, God holds back punishment so that they will repent and not have to go through that punishment. And then we see moments where they do repent. And even though God withholds punishment and judgment, which he would be just in dealing out immediately, he instantly blesses and restores his people when they repent. He withholds his punishment for hundreds of years, but in a moment, he forgives them and restores them when they repent. And don't forget, in mankind's greatest moment of rebellion and hatred towards God, it's in that moment in Genesis chapter 3 when he first promises a savior. Despite our sin, he promises to fix our problem in a way that we never could. This is the most amazing love that we could ever experience. And so what do we learn in chapter 3 here? First of all, we learn that God is sovereign over Satan, and sometimes he uses him to test the faith of his children. We see that Satan twists the words of God to accuse him and make us doubt him. Thirdly, we see that when we sin, there is no excuse. To blame something or somebody else is essentially the same as just blaming God who created that person or that thing that we're trying to blame. We also see that the consequences of sin are threefold. There are consequences between us and God. There's consequences between us and other humans, especially married couples. And there's consequences between us and the created world. We see that because of God's justice, we deserve punishment. However, at the end of the story, we see that because of God's mercy and love, he makes a way for us to have our sins forgiven and eternal life to be ours.